Welcome to the first webinar hosted by the International Congress of Infant Studies. I'm Lisa Oakes, the current president of ICUS, and I'm pleased to be moderating this webinar on online data collection, stories of success and challenges in transitioning from lab-based to online research. Transitioning to online testing is not a quick fix for how to collect data for the six weeks that your lab is shut down, but the current world context provides an opportunity for researchers to try new tools and to move at least some data collection online. Online data collection is exciting and may help us recruit children who we could not ordinarily recruit. It also may help us to keep our research going during times when we need to maintain physical distance. But as you'll learn today, it has its own challenges and may be suited to some questions better than others. Uh, just some housekeeping, we have made a handout of some resources for online testing. You can find it on the handout pane um, in the control panel. Uh, it will also be available uh, online after the webinar later today. And today we have four researchers with us who have been collecting data online, and they'll share with you their experience and answer some questions. We have with us today Casper Adiman of Goldsmiths University London, Molly Dillon of NYU, Mark Sheskin of Minerva Schools at KGI and Yale, and Marjorie Rhodes of NYU. Welcome. The format today is the following. Each of these four will give a brief introduction to their experience with online data collection. And then we will have time for them to answer your questions. If you put your questions in the question window, I'll monitor it and help direct the questions to our panelists. So without any further ado, Casper, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your experience with online data collection. Yeah, hi uh, everyone and thanks Lisa um, for uh, this opportunity. Um, so my, uh, my journey began September 2018, so over a, over a year and a bit ago, when um, Kim Scott asked me if I'd be willing to be an alpha tester for um, MIT's Lookit platform that she's been developing for a couple of years already at that stage. Um, my research is about laughter, and they just wanted a very short, simple, um, and fun experiment that parents could do um, as as a test for the platform um, so that initial brief was um, not to take your um, your sort of rolls royce study um, but to take something that um, would be nice for parents to do in the home um, that would be quick and simple um, and i happen to have had a, um, a a study that we'd done as a survey um, so we'd done that on Qualtrics with a, a three or 400 participants. Um, and I'll, I'll take you through that in a second. Um, and um, so we just sort of converted that onto the, the Lookit platform. So once we've done that, then the parents come uh, to do the study through Lookit. Um, they register for the site, they can pick amongst the experiments which are there. Um, and so recruitment happened through um, through that platform. Parents were already coming to it. And anyone that I wanted to take part, I could direct to it. So let me just start uh, sharing my screen so I can show you a few things. Um, hopefully you can see what's what you want. So I want you to see. Um, so um, this is going to go very fast. This is um, just a, a step through of all the things that had happened as a parent um, takes part in this experiment. And don't try and take it all in. Uh, I'm just showing it just to orient you, orient you um, to what comes later. Um, so they register, give some demographic information, uh, information about their child, um, and then select one of these studies. Um, so this is actually a preferential looking study. Um, it's a quick questionnaire. 
some information about how to set up your uh, uh, your study. There was a consent form there that you, you went through very fast, and then a preferential uh, looking paradigm with a range of things, and then maybe a little questionnaire at the end. <laughs> so <laughs> complete whistle stop tour. I don't don't expect you to take that all in, but that's the platform that we're using. Um, my own study um, was basically just putting a, a questionnaire online. But this really, um, the questionnaire, we never really knew what was going on. We we got parents to take part in three different um, uh, sort of jokes with their children. Um, and in the original questionnaire, we just asked them to rate each one, um, as to do each one three times, rate it for how funny it was. Um, whether the child laughed or not. Um, so we replicated that questionnaire part of the study. Um, but um, the great thing about being online, we were also able to capture um, video for each of the, um, the 15 trials. Um, over the time that we were running the study, um, which started in April last year, and we just sort of up until now, so I guess we've had a year, uh, we had 100 and uh, 32 participants, um, very wide age of ranges, uh, range of ages, which is what we wanted. Um, and we don't even need to talk about the results. Um, but let me just show you what those videos look like. Uh, that, you know, the ironclad law of uh, presenting with babies, you do have to show cute babies. Uh, So the platform is already uh, at each instance of in my study, uh, uh, three jokes each presented three times, uh, five jokes each presented three times. The platform already is capturing those in discrete uh, videos. So each one is individually captures as a short video. It's not all one long video. Um, and it's, um, as you can see, it's not the highest quality video. Um, but it's it's sufficient for you to be able to um, see what's going on, um, and it's got sound there too. Um, the parents don't always set it up right uh, or sort of in the ideal way. So um, uh, we don't, yeah, it would have been nicer to have seen the, the child's face rather than the parent's face here. Um, and that's all the way through for this parent, un unfortunately. Um, but we could still hear. Um, and so if we're doing something about the timing, we could pick that up. Um, but it isn't even always as quite as good as that. So that, that parent actually moved the, the camera about um, uh, halfway through the, 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 um, the sequence of data collection uh, and managed to uh, uh, cut the baby out of the frame for the remainder of the experiment. Um, and uh, it's also worth sort of noticing here, we've got, um, let's play that again. Uh, there's also uh, uh, an, a further adult in the background there who, uh, obviously didn't uh, didn't consent to be part of the experiment. Um, so um, yeah, I would say I, I am really uh, John the Baptist here and uh, uh, Kim is really Jesus when it comes to the online platform. There's a lot of uh, development work that's been going on with um, Lookit for, for several years. And as an alpha and beta tester, sort of I've benefited from a lot of the work that they've done. Um, the, the setting it up from our end, I guess, two things that we had to consider. The ethics um, IRB was very straightforward. Um, we were able to show this is a platform that already exists and we we're able to show all of the consent that had been worked out already by Kim. The really difficult bit for me as a European re um, researcher was getting through our um, data protection, GDPR, um, 
things that we had to get uh, a data sharing agreement um, from our university signed by MIT, that took six months. Um, an institutional agreement coming the other way took a few, um, not, not quite as long. Um, now that that's happened, I think future researchers will be uh, will be quicker than that. It's a, more of a known quantity now that we've we've proved the ground. And I just wanted to show you one of Kim's own Reen, um videos here, um, showing that with this this type of platform, you can collect quite uh, dense data. So this is um, Kim's own baby uh, doing a preferential looking, and it's at six time points over the course of one month, uh, which is certainly something that I want to consider uh, for my future studies. So, um, okay, thank you, Casper. Um, okay. I People are having are already asking some questions about this. Um, um, there is some resources about or information about Look It on the handout. It's not yet ready. As Casper is saying, he was a early um, adopter, and Molly's going to talk about her experience with Look It as well. It's not yet ready for prime time, but they're hoping to get there soon. Um, so let's um, let's move on and. Molly, why don't you tell us about your experience? Okay. I am hoping that you can see my screen, but it doesn't look like it. Oh, wait. Can you see my screen? Yes, Molly, we can see your screen. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, I just want to start by thanking Lisa and Icus for organizing this today and inviting me to participate. I'm very excited to be part of this conversation. Um, so what I thought I would talk about for the next five minutes or so is part of my experience shaping an online lab. Um, in particular, what my experience has been translating laboratory-based research for an online platform. So um, I just want to start off by uh, by just giving some shout outs to some folks who have really made this work possible. Agata Bokinska is a postdoc in my lab. She is really um, at the helm now of the infant research that's going on online in my lab. Uh, Elizabeth Spelke was my doctoral advisor, and she's the one who first gave me the opportunity to participate in online research in 2017. So I've been doing this for about three years now. Um, similarly, Kim Scott, who um, Casper mentioned, um, is one of the founders, along with Laura Schultz, of the Look It platform at MIT. And uh, her uh, support and the resources she's provided through Look It have been invaluable to this endeavor, um, at least on the part of my lab. Um, I also want to thank the Jacobs Foundation, who is um, supporting this online research through my lab. So again, I just want to focus on one particular aspect of my experience, and that's the, uh, the translation or the attempt to translate in-person research, the kinds of sensitive experiments we do in controlled laboratory settings to the more complicated and noisy um, experiences that one has when they uh, interact with um, experiments online. So at this point, I think it's a real question whether the kinds of subtle manipulations we present to infants in these highly controlled lab settings will actually be translatable to online platforms. Um, and so my hunch, based on my experience so far, is that not all of them will, and I think this is an important consideration. So we might have to sort of vary the goals that we have for lab-based versus online studies with infants um, so that the goal of lab studies may be, for example, to serve as the most sensitive measure of infants' knowledge, but the goal of studies, uh, the goal of infant studies online might be to evaluate whether such knowledge is expressed in these more noisy and complicated environments of everyday life. So let's see, I'm going to move on here. So my lab currently has three studies up on Look It. Um, and I'll focus today on the study for the youngest babies, um, because I think that's maybe what this audience is interested in hearing about, but it's also the one that we've attempted to translate directly from the laboratory to an online setting. So this study is called Baby Euclid. It's, um, it's modeled after a study that was recently accepted and is in present infancy. So we're on theme here in terms of, uh, in terms of the conference organizers. Um, so this was a study looking at infant sensitivity to different shape properties in, in basic visual forms. So I'll give you a little bit more description of this uh, just in a second. So what I'm going to show you here are the basic experimental designs that we used in the lab and online to 
again, give you an idea of the similarity and the attempt for a direct translation from the lab to the online platform. On the left here is a schematic of two of the conditions that we presented to babies online. So it, uh, we adopted a change detection paradigm um, using preferential looking. So what this means is that babies are presented with two streams of dynamically changing images on the screen. Um, on one side, there's a certain kind of change. On the other side, there's that same kind of change, but then an additional change. And if the babies look longer at the side with the additional change, then we can conclude that they notice that change over and above the two changes that are happening um, equally on both sides. So in this particular experiment, we were interested in whether babies could detect a change in shape over, above, over and above a change in size that was happening in the figures in both sides of the screen. So on the top, we have triangles that are changing in shape. On the bottom, we have um, little V-shaped figures that are changing in shape by the relative lengths of the lines that form the Vs. So again, on both sides of the screen, these shapes are changing in size, but only on one is there an additional change in shape. So if babies detect these shape changes, they should look longer at the size where there is both size, excuse me, where there is both size and shape changes. So this is the schematic um, of the lab-based study. These stimuli were presented in a dark room on a four foot by three foot screen. So a very large screen, nothing else was in the room. On look it, we were able to reduce, uh, produ reproduce the shape properties of the stimuli very well, um, but you can see that there are some changes. Uh, perhaps the first one you might notice is that the background is light versus dark. So these were being presented on uh, participants' home computers, and we had no control over the ambient lighting. So we wanted to make sure at least the baby's face was, uh, was bright and they could see uh, shapes on the screen. Um, you might also notice that the babies are positioned differently. So in the lab, we have babies sitting on parents' laps. Um, parents usually keep their eyes closed. Um, and in on Look It, we have babies being held over the shoulder of the parents. This way, parents can keep their eyes open but not see the stimuli, but they can be generally aware of their surroundings. So I'm happy to talk more about that difference um, at some point during the question and answer if folks are interested. So you can see that the, the structure of the experiment is quite similar, although there are some differences. And I'll just show you here quickly sort of a dynamic version of each of the stimuli, each of the sets of stimuli, um, to give you an idea of, uh, of what the babies actually saw in the time course during which they saw these shape changes. Again, this was a subtle manipulation in the lab, right? It may even be hard for you to follow after just a second or two, which side is more interesting because there's an additional shape. But you can see that they are rather equivalent on the two different contexts. So those are the two um, the two sets of experiments with presenting full triangles changing in shape, and here are the ones presenting um, relative length changes in, in open to V-shaped figures. So at this point, I've, I've tried to kind of highlight the, um, the commonalities between the way that these very controlled stimuli were being presented in the two uh, platforms or in the two uh, different contexts, right, uh, on, online and in the lab. Then we come to what the videos actually look like of the babies participating. And here's where we see quite a bit of uh, variability. So um, these babies on the left are babies who presented or who were presented with the stimuli in a dark room on a large screen. Um, the, uh, the camera view is very steady and we can see the babies looking pretty easily. On the right, we have babies who are, pre who are presented with the stimuli at home uh, in complicated environments with variable behaviors in the parts of the, of the, uh, the parents. Um, and so um, this not only may lead to distraction during the course of the experiment, but also more difficulty in coding in the part of the, of the researchers. So uh, this is sort of the end of the uh, kind of visuals I wanted to present to you guys, but just to bring back the idea that, um, you know, there are real differences between lab-based studies and, and studies on online platforms. So lab-based studies allow for presentations that Online studies can't really provide large screens, navigable environments, in-person interactions. Lab-based studies may also provide a really sensitive setting for discovering cognitive and neural underpinnings of children's knowledge and learning. But lab studies don't reveal whether these abilities are detectable or harnessed in noisy environments like the ones of everyday life. So looking at other platforms could allow researchers to study this behavior perception and learning in these noisy environments, um, even if the stimuli are highly controlled, like the ones I presented here. And so moving forward, I think it makes sense to keep these differences between the lab and, and online in mind and perhaps harness them as a strength for both the lab 
and online studies. So the goal of lab studies might be to serve as a sensitive measure of infant's knowledge, but the goal of online studies might be to evaluate whether such knowledge is expressed in everyday life. So that's what I've got. Thank you, Molly. Um, so uh, this was great and it was nice to, because uh, one of the questions people have is about the comparison of the what, what experiments look like online versus in the lab. And um, I think you gave us a nice sense of that. Another question that is coming up has to do with the fact that Molly and Casper, Molly's in the US, Casper's in the UK, and about the differences between um, uh, platforms that are hosted in the different places. I do, again, I'm gonna point you to our handout again because there are a couple of resources that are being developed or are available that are, um, in uh, European based and so um, there's a, a many babies at home initiative that is being developed now and um, I believe everybody in the leadership is somewhere in Western Europe um, and so that would for European researchers that might be a place to go if you're worried about a, um, a US hosted platform. Um, so now if we're going to turn to some very different directions, some people we invited who are not infancy researchers but have had some experience um, with other kinds of platforms that might be interesting, especially for people who are um, focusing on slightly older children. Yes, Lisa, did you hand it to me? Okay, fabulous, thank you. Um, so my lab started doing remote research with children about a year and a half ago. Uh, the system that we developed is similar to Look It in that it is unmoderated, which means we program the studies, we post them online, and families can participate anytime. So we're not setting up appointments with them and they're not interacting uh, directly with the members of our lab via Zoom or Skype or something like that. So we call that approach unmoderated. Um, I study conceptual development and social cognition, mostly in a little bit older children who are verbal, so usually ages three and up. And so we've been focusing on developing methods for presenting stimuli to children with animations and narrations, and then recording responses that children speak out loud or that they communicate to us by clicking a button on the computer, by pointing and having their parent click for them, or through some other behavior that we can record on their webcam. So our motivation for wanting to do re remote research was really that we thought it would allow us to address new research questions and move in new scientific directions that we really wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And we saw this potential in remote research because we um, were excited about the possibility of including more diverse participants growing up in more diverse environments or allowing us to address new theoretical questions about the processes that underlie the development of social cognition um, across contexts. And also because we saw potential in remote research for facilitating longitudinal studies and studies of parent-child interactions um, in new ways. So I've picked three brief study illustrations that I want to share with you, which highlight some of the different research goals that we've been tackling with this approach. So I am going to um, do the screen share, except I accidentally clicked it away. Um, Michelle, I might need you to resend to me the screen share where I can accept the screen share. Ah, no, yes. You are sharing your it's, screen. It's not sharing or it is sharing? It is sharing. It is sharing? Yes, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, so the goal of the first project was to conceptually replicate one of our in-lab studies remotely to see if it was feasible to replace some of the interpersonal interaction that children typically have with the researcher in one of our studies with animations and narrations. Uh, we wanted to see if we could collect valid data from children in an efficient manner using the system, and then we wanted to compare the data that we collected remotely to that that we had previously collected in person. So the original study had involved about 50 children participating in person in New York City preschools and museums, and the conceptual replication involves the families that you see pictured there. So we had about 200 children from across the United States and the United Kingdom. In the original study, a researcher read the children a story, asked them questions out loud, and then had them point at responses. So we tried to replicate that experience for children as closely as possible. So here's what a task question looks like just as it was presented to children. This is a Zarpy. She draws stars on her knees. This is not a Zarpy. 
she doesn't draw stars on her knees. Imagine that you had an extra cookie that you wanted to share. Who are you going to share your cookie with? The one who is a Zarpy or the one who is not a Zarpy? Okay, so hopefully you could hear the audio for that. I'm gonna ask Lisa that you pipe in and let me know if they couldn't. Um, for questions like that, children could respond either by saying their answer out loud, saying Zarpy or not a Zarpy, or by pointing um, and having their parent click for them or by clicking themselves. So for this study, we wanted to minimize the role of parents in shaping children's responses because parents were not involved in the original study that we had done in person and we really wanna know what children think and how they respond to our manipulations on their own. So to do this, we gave parents instructions at the start of the study, and then we coded each video trial by trial for instances of problematic interference. Uh, we found very little interference, and I'm glad to talk more about how we coded those instances and how we handled them in analyses during the Q&A. Uh, long story short, with this project, we conceptually replicated our original findings, and by having a larger and more diverse sample, we were able to extend them in a variety of ways as well. In the next study, which is still ongoing, our goal was to test the potential of remote research for facilitating longitudinal studies and to begin to examine new questions about the role of context in children's development that become possible by studying children from more diverse environments. So these are participants as of a few months ago in a longitudinal study on the development of racial bias with children from across the United States. We now have about 400 children in our first wave of data collection, and about 200 have so far completed wave two, for which data collection is still ongoing, and we have several more waves planned. The waves are about six months apart. The goal of this is to identify predictors of variation in the development of race bias across time by looking at a range of psychological processes in children over time, and also by collecting measures from parents and other data about children's environments that we extract from publicly available databases um, and link to children via their zip codes. So I'll show you what a simple item looks like that's part of how we assess racial bias online in this study. Here is a kid. How nice do you think this kid is? Really not nice? Not nice? Definitely. A little not nice? A little nice? Nice? Or really nice? So in that study as well, children could respond by pointing um, or by clicking. Uh, and we also coded parent-child interaction throughout this study. In coding the parent-child interaction, we were once again trying to identify interference trials, but we're also coding for a variety of other types of parent-child interaction that could be interesting and inform future research, uh, such as things like social referencing and other forms of nonverbal communication, so we can explore new questions about the mechanisms by which parent beliefs um, about race might be communicated to their children. The last study that I want to illustrate for you is about parent-child interaction in particular. So this is a study about subtle features of the language that parents and children use to talk about gender. Parents and children complete one session together of a picture book task where they um, look at a series of pictures of children or, and grownups doing gender stereotypic and counter stereotypic behaviors, um, and they discuss them in sort of a free form way. And in this way, we can uh, code the language that parents and children use to talk about gender. And then later, we separately assess parents and children's uh, beliefs and attitudes about gender. So here's what the uh, picture book task looks like. Who plays superheroes? Boys. Yeah. Sometimes you girls. You like to play superheroes when you're a girl. Yeah, well, not really like boy superheroes. Like. What do you mean? What's a boy superhero? Like Batman and Superman and. Yeah. yeah those guys. Well, you make up your own superheroes. Who builds with tools? Carpenter. Yeah. This carpenter, I think he's building a house. Yeah. What do you think about this? I like her her shoes. They're nice. Yeah. And I like her hair. Mm -hmm. You know, I like her green. Mm -hmm. So for this study, we code the whole video, including the transcript for various linguistic markers and also the content of parents and children's speech. And we're also studying nonverbal features of the parent-child interactions. For all of our studies, uh, parents decide at the end whether to upload their video. So, um, I don't know how to turn off my screen share. Um, okay, uh, so um, if something unexpected happens in the video that the parent doesn't want to share, they can just not upload it at the end, and that would be fine. When families do choose to share their video, to upload their video, we ask them to set privacy settings so they can choose to restrict access to the video just to our labs, or they can give us permission to share it in a secure way with the community of developmental researchers via Databrary. 
So my lab has been putting together lots of information about how we program studies, how we recruit for online research, how we code the videos, and so on. And there's a new website we're putting together that's in the handout that Lisa has mentioned. Um, so I hope that will be useful to other labs, and I'm glad to take your questions about anything that we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. So um, the last presenter, um, and then, and I, like I said, I'm trying to grab your questions as we go, but uh, let's have Mark um, Sheskin present about his experience, and then um, um, I hope we have plenty of time to talk about some of the questions you have about IRB, recruiting, things like that. So thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm very excited to talk to everyone about two things uh, today. The Child Lab uh, from Yale University. Uh, for the past few years, we've been doing this to do moderated uh, interactions with children. Uh, so in contrast with what Marjorie showed, uh, this is a scheduled interaction over video chat. And then separately, I also want to talk to everyone about childrenhelpingscience.com, which is a new website where anyone uh, can post their online studies uh, for any age, so I know it's called children, uh, but this is for infants as well. Um, so all of you, for example, could post your studies on this, uh, and hopefully you can see my screen share, uh, and someone will call out if that's not the case. Um, so uh, starting with um, the Child Lab from Yale University, uh, this is in collaboration with Frank Kyle and lots of great members of his lab, and it's a platform for doing video chat studies that we've been using for three years, and we've uh, gotten some publications uh, from it already. And I'm going to focus on telling you just two things about it. Why we're using Adobe Connect uh, rather than Zoom, uh, so that people spend some time considering, and Zoom might be the right answer for you, but there's other options. Uh, and then we use a lot of common design features. Uh, so I'll give you an example of that and why we think the more people who use some common design features, it might be better for everyone. So to start off with Adobe Connect, uh, first off, it's very secure for video chat, and I know that's a concern uh, that several people have expressed. You have complete control over the screen layout, uh, including a lot of options, like you can have a whiteboard over here and a PowerPoint over here, and you can decide exactly where your video is compared to the participant video and how big they are. Um, so that's one of the things it does in comparison with some of the alternatives. The script, uh, kind of the notes section in a PowerPoint is visible to you as the researcher, but not to the child, uh, which also means that it's way easier for researchers to run each other's studies, because you can be looking directly at the screen. Uh, it seems like social engagement uh, to the kid, but you get to read through the study script directly. And then a final technical note that sometimes ends up being very important is something that you're sharing, such as a PowerPoint, downloads onto the participant's computer before it's needed, which means that unlike right now, you're getting my screen pixel by pixel. There might be lag, it might be low quality, depending upon your connection. In this case, everything downloads locally before it's needed, and so it's instantly there and very high quality. There are disadvantages as well, including it's less familiar uh, than some of the alternatives. Uh, and we are not wedded to this. Uh, we might change over time, uh, but we've had a lot of success with it so far. The other thing I want to say about the approach we've been using is that we really lean into using common design features. This ends up having some ways in which it's better for researchers, better for children, and overall better for research. I'm going to give you one example of some common design features that we use, which is we use colors to direct the child's attention and to ask for answers in forced choices. This is not always what we do. We can be flexible depending upon exactly what the needs of the study are. Um, but this is something that we often do. Uh, I'll show you our version of the Sally Ann task, and then I'll discuss some advantages that this had. One of the things you can be keeping track of, though, immediately while I show you this, is how the way we're implementing this lets the researcher be blind to condition. I actually don't need to see what the kid is seeing and therefore might not know what the correct answer is at the end. So here is Sally in yellow and Anne in red. And here are two boxes, a blue box and a green box. Here are the two girls and the two boxes. Sally puts her ball in one of the boxes and then she walks away. While she's gone, Anne moves her ball to the other box. 
When Sally gets back, where will she look for her ball? In the blue box or in the green box? And notice in there, the visual could have been the reverse and my script would have been the same because I didn't actually label the color of where it went. Um, and then the kid knows that they're just going to need to say a color in response. So advantage number one uh, of having a lot of common design features uh, and also being able to see the script uh, as the researcher is that everyone can easily run each other's studies with a low amount of training, but a high amount of consistency. Also, any given researcher can run the perfect package of studies for a particular child. If there's a family scheduled at 3 p.m. with a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, and based on the studies they've done before and their ages and maybe their internet connection speed, we know that the best set of studies to do with them will be this one, this one, this one, this one, any researcher can put together that package of studies and run it very easily. It's also easy to replicate studies uh, because all of the materials are already just there being shared amongst the research team. Anyone else could take them and run the exact same study over video chat. And then finally, it's way less cognitive load for the child. Once the child knows that the rhythm of the study session is that the researcher gives a lot of information often directing attention with color, and then we'll ask a question via color choice. The child can spend time focusing on what we're trying to get them to understand, rather than just with what are the mechanics of how this interaction takes place. So here, for example, uh, is uh, the dependent measure slide from one of our other studies. I'm not going to set up what this is. Uh, I just hope to impress you with how visually complicated this is. But a child who's already answered several questions and knows I'm gonna receive information, and then the researcher will say, so what do you think? Yellow, purple, blue, or red? And then they'll know, okay, that's all I need to do in order to answer. Um, I quickly want to change gears uh, and talk about childrenhelpingscience.com. Uh, this is with the list of collaborators you see on the screen now. Um, but we're just behind the scenes making the website exist Really, it's about all of the researchers around the world who submit their studies to it, and then the families who visit it to find these studies. And so this is a website that lists online studies for parents of any type, and it's purely study-based, uh, not lab-based. And I'll tell you two things about it. Uh, number one, it gets better the more people who use it, right? Parents are excited to go there because there's so many studies there. Researchers are excited to post studies because there's so many parents there. And hopefully it's just this win-win loop. Uh, so feel free to submit your studies. When you do, uh, it looks like this. Uh, for example, here's the page for studies for kindergarten up, and the parents see a nice grid with key information about each study. When they click on a study, there's two ways that the study page can look. Either it has some brief information and a link to the academic website hosting this particular study, uh, so that means not a Google form or not just like a general web page about your lab, uh, but here's this specific online study uh, that you can do. Um, or uh, we can provide a contact form where the parent puts in their name, email address, and child age. Uh, that information goes to you, uh, and then you can contact the parent uh, for whatever next step uh, happens after that. Um, so thank you to all of you and also the list of people on this slide. And that's all that I have before we get to Q&A. Thank you, Mark. Um, sorry, I'm multitasking here. So uh, one question that came up during your um, presentation, Mark, and that I think is really important is about this Adobe Connect and if parents have to download um, the application onto their computer. Um, and um, before you answer, I just want to say that I know that um, this is a solution that it's not true with Look It, I think it's not true with Marjorie's um, um, solution, but that there are solutions where parents essentially have, where they do have to download something new onto their computer. Um, and um, can you speak to that? And that you already spoke a little bit to some of the pros and cons, but I think there are also issues that have to do with the timing um, 
so another related issue is, um, and I can't remember if this is true as, with Look It or with Panda, but that the video, uh, there are two options. One is if you are recording video or audio, that it is being recorded uh, in the cloud, like a Zoom uh, uh, conference or a Zoom meeting, or it can be recorded and stored directly onto the participant's computer and then uploaded afterwards. And I don't know uh, what each of you would have to say about that. So why don't we start with you, Mark, talking about Adobe Connect, but then branch out to these broader issues of things being on the participant's computer ver uh, versus in the cloud. Yeah, so for Adobe Connect, depending upon what they already have installed on their computer, for example, Flash, um, and what their browser permission settings are, it might go relatively smoothly, um, or they might need to download. There is a native app uh, for computers. There's also a mobile app that they could use. Um, and this is one of the pain points in using it. Uh, for a non-trivial percent of parents, they run into trouble with this. And so we've done our best to provide resources. We say, oh, email us or call us if you're having trouble. Um, if we were to switch away from using Adobe Connect, it might very well be for this particular reason, especially now that there are so many families uh, in the past month uh, using so many other things, especially I know Zoom uh, has a lot of the market share. Um, we might just meet the parents where they are. So this is definitely uh, perhaps the biggest disadvantage of Adobe Connect. Um, on the other hand, you don't have to sign up for an account or anything, uh, so at least there's that. In terms of where we store the information, um, Adobe Connect will record into the cloud. Uh, we did that for the first few participants, and then we realized we actually only for our current studies want the audio of it, and so we're recording the audio locally on our own computers. Uh, since it's a live interaction, uh, it's not a situation where they record and then upload because uh, you know, they're live interacting with us we get permission to record the audio, um, and then we're recording it locally on our computers. Uh, but then, of course, we have a very secure way that we're dealing with the audio files after they've been recorded. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Uh, what about Look It or Panda in terms of where the videos are stored? Um, yes. We, yeah, we um, just, Present. They don't have to download anything for the web platform that we've been using. It uh, just uses the recording capabilities that are in Chrome and Firefox, and so that's the recorder that we're using. It stays on their computer until they click upload at the end. So the very last thing that happens in the study is that you know they get a green upload button, and we say you know please upload it, and they and 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 they choose to upload it. And we like it that way because that way, if something unexpected happens, someone else jumped into the screen or you know whatever, and they don't want to share the video, they don't have to. Now, we're also collecting data via whatever experimental software program we're using to present the study in the ones that I showed you today. That was always Qualtrics. So that data, which is not video data and not audio data, is being collected throughout. Um, it's hard for us to really use that data it, without the video because we don't know for sure who's completing the study and if there's parent interference and so on. But if the study, for example, involves compensation and we have a family that says, I did the whole thing and then the upload didn't go through, can we still get our gift card? You know, if we see the complete Qualtrics, we definitely do compensate them um, so that when we hope they'll come back, we try to troubleshoot their video for later. So, and you know, we had then run analyses looking at the full data that we collected through Qualtrics for ones that were successful videos or unsuccessful videos, just so we kind of know what's going on. Great. Molly or Casper, what, what is your experience with Look It? Molly? I can join in, sure. Um, so the, uh, yeah. Um, so you don't need to download any extra software for Look It. Originally it had been programmed on Flash, which was a bit challenging. Now it's on HTML5, which works a lot better. Um, but basically, the videos are uploaded and sent automatically to look its own servers. Um, there is some storage on Amazon Web Services, but um, the access to different participating labs is also um, kind of securely monitored. Um, so there is no external uh, software. There's no downloading any videos to your computer that then require to be that are required to be uploaded. Things are sent securely to the look at servers and platforms, and then they're made accessible to researchers. Yeah, uh, the, the one other thing that Max didn't quite come across maybe 
for everybody. Um, Look it is not a two way interaction. It's just uh, the parents controlling their own experiments and interacting with the system. So the, the researcher isn't online at the same time. Yeah, um, right. So that it is like like the so the the two examples, the two kinds of examples we've seen today are these unmoderated where there's video recording and parents decide whether or not you want to save the recording or in Mark's case this sort of more interactive and I'm certain that people will be developing all different combinations of these things these are just the examples that we have for today to show what people are doing what is possible um, people are also very concerned about the um, ethics, uh, IRB security, uh, and this is very much related to what we've just been talking about, about where the data are stored. Um, at UC Davis, we've been going through this process ourselves, and these are issues that our internet security team, our IRB, our Office of Research is very concerned about is where, where are the data how are they being encrypted? What are the security issues? So um, any tips that you have in terms of dealing with your offices of research, with your um, IRB, with any interactions you've had with internet, uh, your security, uh, information security offices on your campuses. So Marjorie and Molly are both at NYU. Casper is in the UK, so we're gonna, we sort of have three use cases here. Um, so I don't know who would like to, maybe Casper, you can go first, because there are many people on the chat who are, um, have some specific, specific concerns about being not in the US. Yeah, so, so the data I've collected has been uh, um, about 60% US participants, 60% um, EU participants. Um, and the that is all stored in uh, look it look it servers and then um, I take a, a secure copy over to my uh, uh, local um, goldsmiths uh, um, machines and it has been a it was very slow to get the lawyers to sign off on it but um, the actual um, original data sharing agreements and um, all of the questions we had from ethics were were pretty straightforward and i think the best advice for people who are confronting that is and are, are using look it as a platform is to join the the slack forums and discuss it with the people who are already there so there are about 130 uh, researchers at some stage in the process with look it already and so someone will have already gone through um what you're about to go through um with a very similar sort of situation. Um, and it's about, I think um, that on, we were one of the first um, in, in Europe, but that will answer it for other people in Europe is if they come to me and say, right, what was your data sharing agreement? What does it look like? Um, can I see your ethics? Can I show it to my ethics committee? Yes, Molly. Um, I think uh, maybe one place to start for folks, and this can probably be an international starting place, is if your a lab already uses Databrary, um, that's a kind of good jumping off point to present to your legal teams or your IRB as something that kind of is already in place in your institution that you might be using. So Databrary is a repository of uh, video data of, of developmental um, uh, studies, and a lot in developmental psychology started um, by my colleague, Karen Adolf at NYU. Um, it's a fabulous resource, and it's also another way that that uh, developmental video data is being shared. So the way that I approached getting approval for this, uh, for using Lookit through NYU, was to kind of make an analogy to this existing resource that we're all already using and I already have approval for, Data Brewery. And so that might be a good idea for some folks to kind of reach this topic with their, uh, you know, to get a user agreement from a legal team or to get an IRB approval to, to show the similarities between collecting video data online in an active way and then using repositories um, like Databrary. Maybe I'll also mention one more thing, which is that one thing that the IRB cares about is that uh, parents kind of have opportunities to say no or to back out, right? So there are, I think um, Marjorie mentioned in Panda and certainly the case in Lookit that you can decide after the fact 
um, that, uh, you know, you don't want to be really contributing your video data anymore, right? So you have the opportunity to opt in. Um, you take your consent recording. At that point, it's pretty clear you're going to be video recorded. At the end, you give your permission whether or not you're going to, you know, you're going to decide to move forward with submitting those videos um, for, to the research team. So there are a couple of different steps where the parents have a chance to to um, to say no to their participation in, in terms of um, contributing the video data. Great, Molly. Mark, do you have a, a different experience or something different to add? Um, sure. In, in our case, we had maybe the easiest sell to our ethics committee because it's a live interaction with a researcher. They're used to that sort of process. Um, and so we really leaned into this is not a big deal. You know, this is the sort of thing you approve, just a little bit different. And they they thought that that was right. Um, it is a tiny bit different in that we're not getting a physical form signed by the parent. Instead, it's a verbal uh, consent that is then recorded uh, on an audio file. Uh, but we have available uh, in the handout uh, that's linked uh, here um, our introduction, consent, assent warm-up slide sequence that we begin every session with um, that shows how we give the information about what the session is and answer questions and then get the verbal consent uh, from the parent and the assent from the child. Um, but we got it approved on our first try uh, with the Yale IRB. Um, I think because it is just this sort of straightforward thing of a, an interaction with a researcher that they're used to approving. Great. So, um... Our time is going very fast. I think we have time to sort of deal with one more issue. Um, uh, for those of you posting questions, I am going to figure out a way that we can answer your questions offline as well. So keep posting them and, and look for our answers. Um, but another thing that has come up over and over in these questions is about recruiting and about um, the diversity of the sample and about um, people who do or do not have certain resources. I know, Marjorie, that was part of your explicit goal before the pandemic to uh, why you went online. So maybe you can start talking about that um, and we can uh, see what others have to say. Yeah. Um, so we, those are great questions. We launched our site about 15 months ago and we have um, had about 1,200 families that have participated over that time. And they're spread, I mean, you saw how they're spread out geographically um, in the in the figures that I showed, shared with you. Uh, we do collect a lot, um, so there's a lot of geographic diversity, um, which is important to us because families are, the children vary in terms of the level of racial, ethnic, linguistic, and economic diversity in their neighborhoods and that's something we've done a lot of work to quantify for our participants um, so I think that's really interesting the sample um, so mostly we've recruited via social media both by making Facebook and Instagram accounts and posting on them and also by doing paid ads on Facebook and Instagram and we're starting Google ads we also did some advertising on parenting podcasts and we also just did some social networking so emailing things out to various contacts that we had or that our community partners had at different schools, YMCAs, religious groups all across the country, and, and they would just sort of blast, you know, their lists with, here's something fun you can do from home. Um, so that's been pretty effective. The social media advertising is the easiest thing to do consistently, and it's pretty effective. Um, I would say the sample that we get is more educationally, politically, um, and socially diverse than we would get um, in New York City on its own by a lot. It's not without effort more racially and ethnically diverse. In fact, given that our in-person research is in the New York City public school system, it would actually be less diverse with respect to race, ethnicity of the participating children themselves without effort. But there's effort that you can do online by either targeting social media, advertising, by reaching out to particular community organizations, um, and I think that you can, you, it, it's, it's possible, but takes effort <laughs> to recruit a sample that reflects, you know, all of the racial, ethnic, linguistic diversity um, of the United States, certainly. Um, I do, I will quickly mention two other things, which is we've also done some recruiting. Um, if that's not 
the uh, generally about recruiting but not about diversity if you want to recruit quickly uh, we also have had some success posting studies on prolific which is a research platform that's you know designed for use with adults but can work with you to post a study for parents that they then bring their children into that we have found very um, efficient and those sample of families we had from the UK were all recruited from prolific um, we are um, in the resources handout that, that Lisa has put together. We are, have the um, website that my lab is putting together with all of our recruitment materials and also a lot of the details of the sample that we've collected. So I hope that will be useful as well. Yeah, thank you, Marjorie. Mark? Um, yeah, so likewise with the childlab.com platform, we have a much more diverse sample uh, than we would get uh, locally at Yale Labs or in museums in New Haven. It is still not representative of the whole population of the world. Um, I think that Kim Scott at Look It has found that when you compensate, you get a more diverse sample than when you don't. Uh, so that can be an important thing for people to keep in mind. Um, but the final thing I want to add is that we're really hoping that the childrenhelpingscience.com website uh, helps everyone recruit a diverse sample. Uh, so, you know, I'll kind of end by just doing one last plug of that, saying if everyone is putting their studies there uh, and everyone is trying to recruit into there, then hopefully we all end up with a larger and more diverse sample uh, than we might otherwise. Yes, Molly? I'll just add quickly that I think that Mark and his team's creation of this site is really going to help. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that when we started advertising for these online studies, the parents had one thing to do. There was no reason to kind of come back to the site and see, oh, there are there more opportunities. There wasn't really a sense of community about they're around participating in online developmental research. Now, when there are going to be tens of studies available for different age ranges, I think parents and children are going to want to go back and see if there's more that they can do. Um, and I think that's going to be a really important um, step in, again, kind of creating norms and community around this kind of stuff, which will ultimately benefit everybody. I'll say one more thing about this um, through my own experience. Uh, the way to get parents to kind of stay and share with their friends is to have good tech. So this is really a big challenge. Um, but we've encountered parents who've been both really happy with the way that the studies have run and then also not so happy in terms of how the technology is displaying on their screens, if they're, you know, if they have good troubleshooting, if there's someone to contact. <clears throat> and the better that technological experience, the more likely they seem to be to share the experience with friends. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as well, I think. I also would like to um, point out that uh, we're getting a lot of questions about the children helping science and um, it being um, North American sort of hosted or whatever, but we are an international community. We certainly are at ICAS. SRCD is also uh, sort of spreading its international wings a little more and that there's nothing inherent in the children helping science that says that the researchers or the parents have to be um, in the US. There get to be some interesting questions in terms of compensation. So if you are in the US and your IRB has approved you to give Amazon gift cards or Target gift cards to your participants, that might not translate to another country. And there have been on, um, on some of these Slack forums, there have been some discussions of if people are crossing international borders in their recruitment, how are they going to handle that? And maybe in our uh, in materials that we develop after this, we can talk a little bit more about that. Casper, uh, in 30 seconds, do you have something to add about recruitment? Um, uh, just to reiterate Mark's point, that there really is a network effect that um, when there's once there's more experiments on the platform, um, the same person will do multiple of them, and then they're more likely to bring other parents in. Well, on that note, our time is really coming to a close. Um, I hope you all have found this to be as informative as I have. I thank Casper uh, uh, and Molly and Marjorie and Mark for all their really useful information and sharing their uh, experience. Like I said, we will be putting together, uh, trying to put together some answers to some of the questions that we did not get to. 
Um, the recording of the webinar will be available in a few days uh, on demand for members of ICUS. So if you're not a member of ICUS and you want to see this, uh, join us. Um, I also um, want to plug our virtual ICUS meeting in July, um, July 6th through 9th. Keep looking for that, um, those announcements that we're keeping the uh, uh, registration rates as affordable as we can. And we are going to continue many of these discussions in the context of that meeting. So in addition to being able to present your work, we want to have more of these kinds of discussions about how people are managing to continue their research in the current context. So thank you, thank you, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.